Welcome to Pathophysiology. I'm Dr. Brian Salampa from Grand Canyon University, and I'm going to get this chair out of my way before I start talking about anything. And uh, we're going to get started on our first topic, which is mechanisms of pain. And uh, here we go. So, welcome to topic one, mechanisms of pain. As you go through each section of this uh, course, please pay attention to the objectives that are listed in, at the beginning of each PowerPoint because the objectives line up with the test questions. As you can see, we start this course off with evaluating, okay? Evaluating the basic cellular adaptation to disease. Evaluating the purpose of pain receptors and their functions and analyzing the etiology and mechanism of pain in the various organ systems. The first thing that I want you to notice is my choice of verbs in these objectives. Evaluate and analyze. These are higher level uh, verbs. Okay, so that should, should, should suggest to you that you need to know much more than just definitions. You need to know these topics at a level of mastery. We'll talk about more of this in detail later on, but keep in mind that although learning terms is important, you'll be asked to either recognize or provide examples of these processes on your exam. So again, know them really, really well. Slide two, we're gonna start off with uh, a quick review. You should already be familiar with this concept, but as a quick review, you should know that normal homeostatic, meaning regulated and stable, organismal function involves a complex integration of cellular and systemic function. The study and treatment of diseases and physiological abnormalities, therefore, also requires the ability to differentiate between primary, meaning arise spontaneously, and secondary, which follows and results from an earlier disease or injury or event, okay? So primary on their own, secondary due to something else, okay? In either case, um, the ultimate goal of integrated cellular function is to maintain overall organismal function in the face of ever-changing internal and external conditions, which we call, of course, homeostasis, right? Uh, to accommodate for these changes, most cells have the ability to adapt slightly in one way or another. Okay, adapted cells are, they're neither normal or injured. They're just adapted. Uh, they may return to their normal state when or if conditions ever return to normal, or they may become pathologic, meaning diseased or dysfunctional. So let's talk about some of these adaptive changes. Uh, the most significant adaptive changes include atrophy, uh, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia, dysplasia. Now, atrophy and hypertrophy can be subclassified as physiological, meaning normally occurring, or pathologic, meaning diseased or dysfunctional, like I just said. Um, atrophy just means that the size of the cell decreases or shrinks. We've all seen this when someone had a cast on their arm for three months. Right? What happens when the cast comes off? They have a little arm. That's atrophy. Remember your prefixes, your roots and your suffixes. Putting a in front of a word means without, or in this case, much less. So, atrophy, decrease shrinkage. This time, it means a decrease. Normally, if you can say normally, an a means without completely, and they use like an or an to mean less than, but in this case, atrophy is just a decrease in the size of the cell, okay? Um, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, the broken arm, and um, anyway, it's reversible, right? So in the case of a broken arm and you had the cast immobilizing the arm for a long period of time, um, that's normal physiological change, right? Can you think of an example where a cell might go through atrophy that is pathologic, where a cell would shrink in size, but it's not a uh, normal physiological process. Okay, think about that. Uh, while we move on to our next term, oh, I'm sorry, there's a atrophy, the atrophied legs, right? That's not normal, is it? The atrophies like that? What does that remind you of? Maybe starvation, 
Marasmus, Quashorcor, sound familiar? If not, you can you can look it up. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about hypertrophy now. Okay, Our, uh, again, what does hyper mean? It means too much, doesn't it? You knew that already, right? Hyperactive, as in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. That's a good example. So we can pretty much guess that hypertrophy means too much size, okay? Increase in the size of the cells. Um, a pathological example might be in a large liver when individual cells become too large or at least larger than they should be. Uh, now you tell me, what is a normal cause of hypertrophy that we see every day? Normal cause of hypertrophy or increase in size of cells that we see every day. Let me show you. Eh? Hypertrophy. You're not getting any more cells, assuming you're more than six years old, when you work out, but your individual cells are getting bigger, as in hypertrophic. Okay? Our third type of adaptive change. Oh, there's your hypertrophy of your heart cell, for example. Uh, your heart muscle, your entire heart hypertrophy, like one side of it, your left side in this case. Um, anyway, our third type of adaptive change is hyperplasia, increase in the number of cells. Okay, it can be subclassified also as compensatory, like reacting to something, um, or hormonal. Hormonal can be another subclassification because of hormones, or it can be pathologic because of some kind of a disease, right? Um, hyperplasia, hyperplastic. So let's start with breaking the word down. We know hyper means too much. So all we have left to learn is that plasia means something like growth of cells, right? So hyperplasia increase in number of cells. Notice that the difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia is that trophy is the same amount of cells, but larger in size, and plasia is an increased number of cells. The example, okay, sorry, there it is. Okay, now the example that I give here for metaplasia or metaplastic change is the epithelium in the airways and smokers. So the constant irritation of all the smoke and toxins found in cigarettes causes the mucus secreting ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelio say that three times, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells, they're replaced by stratified squamous epithelium. This gives it a little more protection from assault. So if the person stops smoking, that is before permanent damage results, the metaplastic cells can reverse and go back to normal. In fact, metaplasia is usually a compensatory response, but Sometimes it can transition to dysplasia, which is almost always pathological. Okay, now dysplasia is the last type of adaptive cellular change that we're going to discuss at this time. You already know that dys means bad or something like it, don't you? Yes, you do. Don't diss me, bro. You can see from the drawing that these cells have little organization left in them. Um, they're just kind of thrown together, unorganized, largely recognizable as a specific type, any specific type of epithelium. Uh, it's why your pap smear is so useful in gynecological exams. Okay. Um, dysplastic cells, they can be identified before they go completely cancerous and therefore um, you can remove them. Now this other slide, I, I like this little picture right here. I don't know where it came from, but uh, I stole it from somewhere. If this is your normal squamous epithelial cells, uh, what I want you to look at here is, okay, this should be old school. You should have learned this in earlier anatomy courses. Uh, your basic cells, your, your squamous cells, stratified, more like egg shape. This is a little bit different drawing, but more like little, you know, egg shape, shape oval kind of things. They, kind of line up, line up, and they, and they start losing their nucleus as they go further and further away from the basement membrane until they kind of flake off. Okay, that's pretty basic stuff. As you get into the dysplastic part, look at the white parts along this basement membrane. Okay, if you can see this, and you may have to zoom, but the little white parts, 
they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes further along through the different layers of dysplasia and into the cancer part of it, okay, the carcinoma in situ. And then invasive cancer is when it starts going all over the place. In situ just means it's at least there. It didn't go anywhere, okay? Um, but notice that they get more spaces as it goes higher up. You know, you get your white here and it goes higher, higher, higher in, away from the basement membrane. You're starting to see all of these different changes here that uh, will tell you that it's cancerous. Um, because of, I want to keep these videos fairly short, and this is already getting a little bit long, even though we're only three slides into it. I'm going to break it off here, and we'll call this the Adaptive Changes video. And I guess that's it for now.